Hello, everybody, and welcome to Bible class for September 20th, 2020. Today we are in the youth room at Naperville Church of Christ because that's where we would normally have Bible class. So we're going to have Bible class in the youth room for a change. Anyway, um, before we jump right into class, because we've got a lot to cover today, um, we're going to draw a name to see who won our $10 Amazon gift card um, for last week. So if you sent in your notes um, for last week's class, which we where we wrapped up our series on the big picture, then your name is in this basket. And, and I have a very special guest who is going to draw the name for us today. And that special guest is Heather. It's Hi, Heather. Everyone. Yep. So um, if you want to see more of Heather, you can watch her on Bible Blast or Bible Brainiacs, which is the video series that's out there for our Arrow Children's Ministry. So if you have younger siblings or you would just rather watch those videos than look at me, then you can go watch uh, watch her. So anyway, we're going to jump right into it. This is exciting and I know Heather's excited about it. We're going to draw a name. Who is the winner of this week's $10 Amazon gift card? This is so exciting. Who is it? It's Elena. Elena. Elena, see, I told you guys at the beginning that you can win multiple times, and Elena has won again. She has won again. She is piling up that Amazon money. So, everybody say goodbye to Heather. Bye. And we're going to jump right into it. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, it's good to see you guys, and it's fun to be in this room. I don't spend a lot of time in this room, um, but... It's cool to be here right now. And so we're going to start with a prayer and then we're going to jump right into our lesson for today. God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to study it. Um, ask that you give us the wisdom to understand it and to apply it to our lives, God. Be with us today. Keep us safe. Keep us healthy. And thank you for your son and the sacrifice that he made for us, God. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So today, today, and I said we're going to jump right into it. And I might move fast today because I don't want this video to be um, extremely long. But um, today is the first of three messages on the book of Micah. Um, this is one of the 12 books that make up what we call the minor prophets. And minor doesn't suggest that these prophets are less important, only that their books are shorter. Um, Micah is only a handful of of pages long. So we don't know much about the prophet Micah. He's not really mentioned anywhere else. He lived during the time of the divided kingdom where following the reign of Solomon, the Israelites had fractured into two nations. And those two nations were um, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. So this map of the divided kingdom highlights where different prophets were from. And you can see Micah's town, Moreshef Gath, highlighted down in the lower left in Judah. It was a small nation, and he lived only about 25 miles from Jerusalem. Now, there was a lot of tension between Israel and Judah. The kings in Israel had wandered away from God. They were worshiping other gods and had put pagan idols in the temple. And now Judah did a little bit better they had some good kings, but they had a lot of bad ones who ignored God as well. Now, there are a few things that we do know about Micah. Um, he seemed to have been educated. Even though his book is short, he wrote in several different styles. He knew different audiences and regions would need to be communicated to in different ways. And he had the education to do so. Now, he was a prophet for decades spanning the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And we know approximately when the book of Micah was completed. It's a, com it's a collection of his prophecies put together over time, and it was finished around 700 or 710 BC, which means it is at least 2,700 years old. Now, Micah had a great concern for the poor. And this series is called The Poor Man's Prophet. Micah wasn't just speaking to the poor, he was speaking to everyone and advocating for the poor. So for the time period, this was considered deviant theology. 
It was and is godly to advocate for the poor, but it was deviant to the people at the time because their assumption was that if you were wealthy, it was because you had done something right and God was blessing you. Therefore, if you were poor, which described about 85 to 90% of the people, it was because you or your ancestors had sinned in some way and God was punishing you. Now, the wealthy would use this belief to justify not helping the poor. After all, it must have been God's will that they are suffering and starving. Now, throughout Scripture, God communicates a deep concern for the poor, the downtrodden, the abused. And Scripture communicates that God has blessed the rich so they are able to help those in need. Now, there is a shocking example of God's concern for the poor found in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, people tend to say that God destroyed them over their sexual sin, okay? But in Ezekiel 16, 49, we find the one place where Sodom's sins were clearly spelled out. Ezekiel 16, 49 says, Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony, and laziness, while the poor and needy suffered outside her door. So Sodom's biggest sin was ignoring the poor and needy. God goes on to say in Ezekiel 16, 50, so I wiped her out. So while Micah addressed this topic more thoroughly than most, it is a concern of God's that shows up throughout scripture. Now, Micah is essentially three sets of prophecies. The pattern for each is moving from doom to hope, with three themes repeated throughout the book, judgment, restoration, and justice. Today, we're going to look at the first set of prophecies, chapters one and two. Now, we don't have time to look at every verse, but here's the big picture outline, okay? One, God's people are toast, okay? He's going to toast Judah just like he toasted Israel, all right? And toast in this sense is, it's, it's not good. It's super sad because it's going to be really bad, all right? Um, now, here's why they're toast. One, the rich people are mean, all right? And they're ignoring God, all right? And then the third point is that there's a few that won't get toasted. All right. Uh -huh. So the people of Judah would have been stunned at the idea that they would be judged like Israel had been. From their perspective, Israel deserved it for following pagan gods, while Judah still claimed to follow God. The idea that they were guilty of that level of sin would have been a shock to them, but it was the truth. So let's dive into it and see exactly what Micah had to say to each of them. Um, each of the three prophecies start with the word attention. Some Bibles translate it as hear. Micah is formally calling their attention to what he's about to say. Micah 1, 2 through 9. Attention, let all the people of the world listen. Now this is fascinating um, he was speaking to the people of Judah, but his message is for the world. We can all learn from the mistakes they have made, okay? Um, going on, let the earth and everything in it hear. The sovereign Lord is making accusations against you. The Lord speaks from his holy temple. Look, the Lord is coming. He leaves his throne in heaven and tramples the heights of the earth. The mountains melt beneath his feet and flow into the valleys like wax in a fire, like water pouring down a hill. And why is this happening? Because of the rebellion of Israel. Yes, the sins of the whole nation. Who is to blame for Israel's rebellion? Samaria, its capital city. So up to this point, the people listening to him were thinking, this is awesome. God is coming. They are looking forward to the day God will return and give them the full promised land and the prestige and status they once had. They were excited because they thought this might be it. And the stuff about Israel just made sense. Judah knew Israel was messed up, but then Micah takes a shocking turn. Where is the center of idolatry in Judah? 
in Jerusalem, its capital. So Jerusalem was the capital of Judah. It was the home to the temple and the people of Judah claimed to still be following God while Israel had been blatant in how they stopped following God. Judah was more subtle in their sin. They may not have had pagan idols, but Micah revealed that they made money, power, and possessions their idols. So much so, in fact, that they would trample over anyone to build their wealth and power, even their own people. So God, through Micah, called them out, revealing that their sin was just as heinous as the Israelites in the north. Verse 6. So I, the Lord, will make the city of Samaria a heap of ruins. Her streets will be plowed up for planting vineyards. I will roll the stones of her walls into the valley below, exposing her foundations. All her carved images will be smashed. All her sacred treasures will be burned. These things were were bought with the money earned by her prostitution, and they will now be carried away to pay prostitutes elsewhere. So this comment on prostitution wasn't a metaphor, all right? Pagan religions involved prostitution at their temples. God promised Judah that everything would be destroyed and all the wealth taken by a conquering enemy, the same way that it happened to Israel. So in a way, the Jews had been relying on God's promise that they would be a nation as almost a like get out of jail free card. But that covenant was not a good luck charm, and God promised judgment if they didn't follow him. So in verse 8, Micah began what is called a lament. This was a common practice. So when he said, therefore, I will mourn and lament, I will walk around barefoot and naked, he's not literally naked. The practice was to be in a loincloth. Um, I will howl like a jackal and moan like an owl. So a funny bit of trivia, they recently realized the Hebrew word translated to Al in verse 8 was a mistake, and it should actually be translated ostrich. Have you ever heard of moaning ostrich? Um, Well, neither have I. Uh, The practice 2,700 years ago was that when you were grieving, grieving over a huge loss, you would go barefoot, wear fewer clothes, and weep loudly to symbolize brokenness and the depth of your pain. Micah is using the loudest animals he can think of to communicate tremendous agony. For my people's wound is too deep. This is verse nine. For my people's wound is too deep to heal. It has reached into Judah, even to the gates of Jerusalem. The news was bad. It was, it was too late to avoid judgment. In verse 16, at the end of this lament, we, re- we read, O people of Judah, shave your heads in sorrow. For the children you love will be snatched away. Make yourselves as bald as a vulture, for your little ones will be exiled to distant lands. This is a call to repentance. It is a little hint of hope. Micah wasn't just putting on a big show. He was genuinely lamenting and inviting the people to join him in this lament. He was saying, We all need to recognize how far away we've fallen from God because maybe we can stop this train, which gets us to chapter two. Now, one of the things to notice is that there were a lot of false prophets. They were telling the people what they wanted to hear, that God was blessing them, that they were wealthy because God wanted them to be, and they were okay to take advantage of the poor to steal their food, land, and income because it was God's judgment on the poor. So for us today, moving and changing locations is a common thing. Okay, there isn't the same sense of family identity tied up in a specific property. In ancient times, there was a deep family connection to their land. It was passed from generation to generation. Family land would provide their status, their influence, and identity in the community. The wealthy had taken advantage of the hard times by robbing these people of their family lands. The false prophets were telling the wealthy and powerful what they wanted to hear. When Micah opposed them, the wealthy chose instead to listen to the false prophets. Now I read this passage and wonder how could they or how they could rationalize the idea that God would want them to rob the poor. Then I thought about reality TV. Um, 
Have you seen some of the awful like American Idol auditions? Now, I feel so bad for the people as they get ripped to shreds. And they're genuinely shocked that they're getting ripped to shreds. I mean, how could they be so blind to the reality? I mean, did you know that by the time someone appears in front of a, well, Simon Cowell or whoever the judges are now these days, that they have gone through months of interviews and further auditions. Each step of the way, producers are telling them that they're amazing. Their story is one America needs to hear. Their voice is powerful. It's exactly what they want to hear. So they believe it in spite of all the evidence to the contrary until the show finally gets what it wants a horrible audition it can use to get a laugh. So how do these people not know their voices aren't good enough? Because they're listening to the wrong people. All right. And that's what was going on in the book of Micah 2,700 years ago. There were voices telling them lies, but they liked the lies. The lies made them feel good about themselves and what they were doing. It felt so much better to listen to the false prophets than to listen to Micah. All right, in Micah chapter two, verses one through three, verses six through seven and 11 through 13, he says to the rich people, what sorrow awaits you who lie awake at night, thinking up evil plans. You rise at dawn and hurry to carry them out simply because you have the power to do so. When you want a piece of land, you find a way to seize it. When you want someone's house, you take it by fraud and violence. You cheat a man of his property, stealing his family's inheritance. But this is what the Lord says. I will reward your evil with evil. You won't be able to pull your neck out of the noose. You will no longer walk around proudly, for it will be a terrible time. Don't say such things, the people respond. Don't prophesy like that. Such disasters will never come our way. Should you talk that way, O family of Israel? Will the Lord's Spirit have patience with such behavior? If you would do what is right, you would find my words comforting. Over the next few verses, Micah essentially said, you're listening to the wrong people. You're doing the wrong thing and you know it. All right. So let's pick up his response in verse 11. Suppose a prophet full of lies would say to you, I'll preach to you the joys of wine and alcohol. That's just the kind of prophet you would like. Someday, O Israel, I will gather you. I will gather the remnant who are left. I will bring you together again like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. Yes, your land will again be filled with noisy crowds. Your leader will break out and lead you out of exile, out through the gates of the enemy cities, back to your own land. Your king will lead you. The Lord himself will guide you. The hard truth was that while there was a little bit of hope, there was going to be a lot of suffering before the hope would come to pass. Now we're going to tackle the question, where did they go wrong? But first let's look at Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. So sometimes we might think that Jesus created that command in the New Testament, but it was actually a law from Deuteronomy and Leviticus that the Jews had known for centuries. Jesus singled it out as one of the two most important laws out of the 613 laws found in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. So where did they go wrong? First, they gave their love to idols. In Israel, they literally had idols to other gods. In Judah, they made money, power, and possessions their idols. They loved them more than they loved God. Second, they let their greed have its way. They wanted these things so bad and listened to the people that justified their desire, these false prophets. And third, they used their power for themselves. Now, each one of us has power. You have influence and there's somebody that you can and do impact. You have power to do and achieve things. 
And one of the challenges for Micah is, how do you use your power? Are you like the people of Judah using it for evil or are you using it to help others? Now, finally, they listened to what they wanted to hear. Instead of listening to wise counsel, which may not have been what they wished to hear, they chose to listen to false prophets that justified their wrong desires. Now, here's the challenge for us. We see how angry God was that these people let their selfishness listen to the wrong voices and to take advantage of others. We need to be asking ourselves questions like, what are the things in my life I love so much that maybe I love them more than God? Are they getting in the way of me following God? What are the ways or what are ways that I have power that I could use for others instead of myself? It might be as simple as just helping your younger sibling with their homework. You could use your power to build them up. It might be something more significant. You're, you're going to volunteer somewhere, take a portion of the money you make from your job and give it to some organization that is making a difference. I mean, there are so many ways that you can use your power. And then finally, have you thought about the voices that are influencing your life? Are they influencing you away from God or towards God? Are you becoming the type of person you want to be or do those voices need to change? All right, which leads me to some questions that I would like you to answer this week. Um, what things do you love that could become idols? That's the first question. Second question. In what ways do you have power that you could use to love your neighbor? And the third question is, how can you recognize what voices you should let influence your life and decisions? Um, normally in an in a in-person setting, we would sit down and discuss these questions. But what I want you to do is answer these questions um, and then email me the answers to your questions to rskipworth at naperville.church.org. rskipworth at naperville.church.org. And um, if you do send me the answers to these questions, I will enter you into the drawing for next week's $10 Amazon gift card. So um, that's it for this week. And the first, um, first message in the uh, series, uh, Micah, the Poor Man's Prophet. And I hope you have a great day and we'll see you next week. Bye.